So we're going to uh, morning all, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, we are going to start, to continue the class exactly where we left off uh, on uh, Monday. So does anybody remember what was the last thing we covered on Monday? Anyone? Oh, we spoke about no, language Australia. modeling. Yeah, yeah Rashmi? No, I was just saying like the poles are visible. Just wanted to confirm that. Which are visible? The poles oh, are visible, right? Yeah. right? yeah. Okay. So yeah, what was the answer again? Uh, we spoke about language modeling. Yes, and before that we were speaking of uh, different kinds of models, right? Uh, do you remember the distinction between time synchronous and order synchronous? Raise your hands if you do. I'll wait for about 30 of you to raise hands. So continue raising your hands, I'll wait. Okay. Uh, all right, so there are only 73 people in class today. Very interesting. It's almost as if, you know, it doesn't matter. Anyways, uh, so this distinction is something that we're actually going to build on, okay? Now let's continue with the different network variants. We uh, saw different kinds of network variants, but then uh, uh, let's start go back and start with this problem over here. This is a network that takes a sequence of inputs and produces a single output at the end of the sequence. For example, analyzing a sequence of text and telling you it's, uh, uh, telling you it's sentiment or analyzing a little bit of speech and telling you what was spoken, that kind of thing. So this is uh, the kind of uh, network that you'll encounter in. Uh, situations where the entire input must be analyzed and then an answer must be produced like question answering you see someone asks color of sky when the last word is spoken you have to reply uh, blue or speech recognition right you can see the entire sequence of inputs and once the entire sequence of inputs is spoken now it is observed you have to recognize what was spoken and so on, all of these different issues, uh, different uh, uh, problems where the same setting works. Or now, in these cases, inference is fairly straightforward. You're just going to pass the input to the network. And when the last input, so you would know the length of the input. Somebody's asking a question, you know what the last word in the question is. You have a recording of speech, you know exactly what the last vector in the speech is. And so you, uh, once the entire input has been passed in, at the instant of the last input, you just read the output. And that is going to be your classification output. But then, so uh, is this uh, setup? Uh, do you understand the setup? Is this making sense to you folks? Raise your hands. Okay, this is very simple, straightforward, right? But then, what about at these times? Remember that this is a recurrent network where every column is identical to every other column. So there's nothing special about this last column uh, that somehow informs the network that the output must be produced only at this point. In fact, what happens is that there is an output produced at every time you only read it at the last instant. So the uh, situation here is that you have this very symmetric network which keeps producing outputs. When the input is done, that's when you will read the output. When we want to train a network, you're going to, uh, they're going to get an input of this kind, uh, a training instance of this kind. You would have a sequence of, an input sequence, and then you'd have a single label during forward inference, it pass the input sequence through the network. You get, you read the output at the end of the input and you get some output. You compare it to the target output for that sequence. You can compute a divergence and then you can back propagate the divergence through the network to train all of the parameters of the network. But when we are doing this, we are sort of being suboptimal. We are ignoring 
what the uh, some of what the network is actually doing. The network actually outputs values at all of these other times as well. And we're just pretending that it is not doing any, it is not producing any output, and you're only reading the output at the last at, at the last input. So the uh, but then uh, consider say speech recognition. Someone says the phoneme ah, uh, then it's not just at the final output that you know that 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 that, that the uh, phoneme is ah. Uh. Even at these other times, we expect it to begin realizing that what is being spoken is the word is the sound ah. Uh. In fact, if the network outputs a very high probability for e at this time and then switches to ah uh only over here, then there's probably something wrong. So what we can do is instead of completely ignoring these two outputs and focusing only at the final uh, input, we can, uh, we can replicate the target label at each of these outputs and pretend that these outputs are valid as well. And now once you do so, then you've actually converted this to a time synchronous recurrent neural network. And then we can compute local divergences at every time, and the uh, total uh, divergence for this for this particular input is going to be the weighted sum of the local divergences at all of these times. And the actual weight that you use over here is going to be depending on the problem. For example, if you're if you're performing speech recognition, then uh, the uh, you'd expect that if the person said the phoneme ah then at every point of time it's still going to be the phoneme ah and so all of these weights would be one whereas if you had something like question answering somebody asks color of sky then although the network is producing outputs at these times if you assign you don't really know that the answer must be blue till you see the word sky in which case you'd expect the, the you'd uh, want to set the weights at these two other time instances where the uh, uh, where the output of the network doesn't really begin to make sense to something much smaller so, so say zero now again in both of these settings you have the situation where you have a sequence of inputs coming in the output occurs only at the end of the input input sequence but then you are recognizing the fact that the network actually produces outputs at every time and so when you train the network instead of ignoring all of these intermediate outputs you're sort of assuming that it is in fact producing an output at these times as well and that the target output is the same as the as the uh, target output at the final final input so you'd be replicating the target outputs everywhere you'd compute the local divergences at each time. And so the overall divergence you compute is going to be the weighted sum of the local divergences. For problems like speech recognition, it's just going to be the sum of these divergences. For something like question answering, you obviously can't consider the divergences at this time and you only focus at the divergence at the last time. So, uh, and the point of all of this is that you're producing more signal for back propagation to actually uh, train the parameters of the network. So, everybody with me so far? Raise your hands. Okay. So this is easy, right? Now, uh, Professor, are those yeah. weights learned, or uh, do we set them as hyperparameters? This, these are these are just hyperparameters. So, for example. Uh, uh, in this case, for speech recognition, I've said they're all one. For question answering, I mean, th this is with your, this is based on your familiarity with the problem, right? You're not learning. The weights are a part of the divergence function. The divergence function is never learned. Okay, sure. Right. Anyway, but the point I was trying to make is the the real point over here is that this is the problem that you've got. The uh, inference is straightforward. You pass the input in, you read the output at the last instant. But when you want to train the network, if this is all you did, you're being suboptimal. So you're taking into consideration the fact that the network is actually producing outputs at other times as well. And so to exploit those additional outputs, you can simply replicate the label 
and then compute the divergences at all times because now you've converted this to a time synchronous model. And then you can just minimize this divergence, right? And the actual nature of the weight depends on the problem. So straightforward, nothing fancy. But now let's go into the more complex problem here. This is the uh, many to one problem. Now let's consider this one. This is the order synchronous but time asynchronous model and this is what we will call a sequence to sequence model you have a sequence of things going in and you have a sequence of things coming up and uh let me see if i can clear this can this okay so something like say uh speech goes in right x1 x2 x3 you have some speech going in and then you have a sequence of words coming out. So this is a sequence. This is a sequence. This sequence has some length n. This sequence has a length m, which is 2. And m is not equal to n. And in the specific case we are looking at, we are saying m is less than or equal to n. And there is some notion of order in that hello corresponds to this portion of the input and world corresponds to this portion of the input. So this is a sequence to sequence model, okay? And in this kind of setting, it's order synchronous, but not time synchronous. And I assume you remember what the difference, be difference between order synchrony and time synchrony is. Now, so the, here's the general setting. You're given a sequence of inputs and we must asynchronously output a sequence of symbols where each symbol represents a definite class instance like the occurrence of a phony. And this symbol must be output only when the input portion of the input corresponding to the symbol has been completely considered. So over here, this symbol may be output at the end of the portion of the input that corresponds to the phoneme b. This must be output where at the end of the portion of the input that corresponds to the phoneme a. This must be output when the, at the end of the sequence that corresponds to the phoneme term. Now this is in fact, so when you see this, how does this relate to this other model? What is the relationship between these two? Can anyone tell me? Anyone? Just visually, what is the relationship between the just two? Just a combination of them? This is just a concatenation of many of these guys, right? So you think, we know exactly how to deal with this particular model. So you think that just concatenating many of them is, uh, going to be a very simple extension. It turns out it makes things horrendously difficult. And the reason for this is, what could the reason be? If I'm, perform if I'm doing inference, why does this make things problematic? Anyone? We don't know where that expected last node is supposed to we be. We do not know. What is happening is that the network is actually producing outputs at every time. We are only reading some of these outputs as real outputs. But then during inference, the network is just running. There's input coming in, and you could be processing the input you know, unidirectionally or bidirectionally, it doesn't really matter. But at some specific, it's producing an output at every time, but you have to read it at only some specific instance of time, and nobody told you where these boundaries happened. So you have no idea of knowing where to read each of these outputs, right? So how does one deal with the problem? Now, the fact is the network doesn't output just a symbol. What does the network actually output at each time? Anyone? Probability distribution over all symbols. It's going to be producing and outputting a probability distribution over all of the symbols, correct? So you have this sequence of inputs and at each time, you go through the, you know, you go through the hidden layers and then the output, which is a softmax, is going to produce a probability distribution over all of the symbols. 
and from these you have to figure out what these guys are right when to output stuff so what would be an obvious way of trying to figure out uh, the the uh, uh, what my, what the output of the network must be now keep in mind that what the network is doing at any time is computing a posteriori probability so for example what happened to my whiteboard my whiteboard disappeared somehow let me pull up my whiteboard so okay what happens at any time is that the network has a sequence of inputs xn and you are sort of processing all of these and producing outputs right so this is the sequence this could be uni or bidirectional again i'm using unidirectional figures but the directionality of processing is not to be there's nothing special about it you're assuming that this entire input is given okay so what is being output at this time at this time you are producing the probability of the symbol given the entire input which is to say this entire input and so uh, or rather probability that y t equals y given x where y is your entire vocabulary right e and and so at each time you're producing a conditional probability distribution for all of the symbols in your vocabulary given the entire input now uh, so you're going to get something of this kind at each time and now when we want to output something what is it that we actually want to output we want to output the most probable class at each time in your traditional uh, mlp here we want to produce output the most probable sequence of symbols but we want to output the most probable asynchronous uh, order synchronous sequence of symbols now so what we will do here is uh, to recall that any network with a softmax output is actually outputting an estimate of the a posteriori probability of the classes given the input and when you select the class with the highest probability you get what is called the maximum a posteriori probability classification you're picking the class with the largest a posteriori probability and we're going to use the same simple the same uh, same uh, principle here so what we want to find is the most probable asynchronous uh, i mean order synchronous symbol sequence given the input so you're given a, you're given the input and you'll be considering you know a given the input you know a cat given the input whatever else you want to consider all possible uh, symbol sequences given the input and you want to pick the one that has the highest probability so basically what we want to do is to pick the symbol sequence which has the highest probability given the input now sorry Bhiksha, there's a question about why are you talking about the entire input rather than some input at, at a particular point because this is a symbol sequence right remember you're dealing with input sequences so if i give you the entire speech for example or if i give you the entire uh, uh, text if you're doing some kind of part of speech tagging the answer over here depends on what happens at other times as well so whether you're calling this you know uh, a noun or a verb depends on the remaining words in the, in the input or whether you're recognizing this as this word as the word an or the word a depends on what else you have seen so it's always based on the entire input these are sequence models it's sequence to sequence conversion did that answer your question yes no I'm um, so are we assuming that this is bi-directional or so it doesn't yeah. matter right the point is you're given an entire sequence you're analyzing the entire sequence and you're making a prediction in each time but that prediction depends on the entire input sequence 
you could be analyzing it unidirectionally or bidirectionally. That is the uh, that is that is a specification of your model itself. But what it is outputting is the probability for all of the symbols at that time given the entire input. Uh, I'm still a bit confused. Why would say, for example, why would the output at say y seven depend on x eight? Why would the output at y seven depend on x eight? So uh, uh, consider this. Uh, I am say, consider the inputs are words, right? And you give you're being given something, and I want to depend. I want to figure out what this guy is. If the, you have the choice of this being the word apple, or this being the word cat, okay? And let's say I have these are my two previous words, okay? Is the probability of A dependent on the on whether this was apple or not oh. out here no why not oh, actually it? yes there you go right it's dependent on everything else right right so the point is you have the entire sequence you have to consider everything that came in at the input before you decide what's happening at this point okay so you're not talking about what's actually get reflected in the um, it's not instantaneous. You have a okay. sequence, you're producing stuff, right? So one cheap solution to actually finding the order synchronous output is to say that at each time, I will simply pick the most probable symbol. And then this is going to give me a time synchronous output. This is not order synchronous, right? But then what I want is my order synchronous output. So these are my all my symbols, right? And you can assume that this sequence of symbols is basically a repetition of the symbol at the final time. And so you can merge these guys. And then this is going to be your GF, this GF E der. That's your output. Okay. Now, what is the problem with this cheap trick of doing this? Um, Big sure there are like a lot of follow up questions. I guess like students are confused right now. Okay. Um, so one, they are still assuming is this bidirectional. Um, the other one was uh, if at each point they are receiving all input sequences, what makes the output change? Um, yeah, those two were like the main ones. Okay, so here's the point, right? This is here is my abstract the problem out. The abstract problem is you have a speed signal, right? Whatever and you are trying to recognize what was spoken. So I have a cat, for example, correct? So the, in the abstract, you have some sequence of inputs. These are going into a network. How exactly the sequence is processed is up to you. I mean, this is this is some network. This could be a unidirectional network. It could be a bidirectional network, but this network is now producing outputs, right? And you want this network to produce I here, have here, A here, and maybe cat here. This is the, this is what you want the network to produce. So uh, this, again, the, uh, I'm not sure I actually understand the confusion over here about the sequence to sequence bit. So can you, do you mind repeating the question? I think, I think that the confusion is coming from people thinking that the output of each individual time step, when you said that the total sequence is dependent on the entire input, people thought that that meant that you pass the entire input at once. And then the late that, that all of the output is dependent on all of the input, which is only the case for bidirectional. But that's no, not the, all of the output is dependent on all of the input. So you don't, don't worry about whether it's bidirectional or not. So, uh, so the, we will abstract this out and you will see why, okay? So uh, uh, regardless, for now, just abstract this out. You have X1 through Xn. And what you are producing at each time is, so let's, let's split this out, okay? This is the portion of the net 
which computes this output probability table. This is the portion that this is the probabilities. Okay, are you are you comfortable with this level of abstraction? These are my probabilities at each time. This could have been produced unidirectionally or bidirectionally. At this point, I have still not chosen the words. So when I get to this location, when I get, when I get here, I have not made any decision about what was actually spoken. I've just got probabilities at each time. This probability table could have been obtained unidirectionally or bidirectionally. It doesn't matter. Does that make sense to you guys? Answers, uh, guys. Professor, uh, the thing is, uh, the confusion is uh, that if this is unidirectional, then how do the probabilities at say uh, the seventh position depend on what is there at the eighth position? Because if it's been calculated from left to right, it should only depend on the ones that came before it, right? I'm abstracting it out at this point, right? Sure. If you're doing it left to right, you're going to get the probabilities that are only dependent. So uh, this term over here, you are speaking of the symbol sequence, okay? Which is very different from this probability table. And bear with me, okay? So this over here is your compressed symbol sequence, right? This is I have an apple, whereas this is maybe 500 vectors long, okay? Or 300 vectors long. So when I process the 300 vectors, I'm going to get a probability distribution output at each time, whether, regardless of whether I do this unidirectionally or bidirectionally. I have not yet chosen my words. So are you comfortable at that level? I have not yet chosen my words. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, um, yes. Yeah, sorry, a quick, quick clarification. Um, in, if you go back to the slide, why is K minus one fixed? Shouldn't K also be something to be, um, optimized over? We don't know what K is. Okay, so this K is also variable. This K is variable, right? Okay. So now, yeah, assume that I have this, assume that I have already computed this probability table. I have not chosen words, okay? Now from this probability table, I must choose. Once I get this probability table, right? The final choice of whether I'm making I have a cat, or whether I have an apple must be based on this probability table, right? Because I'm trying to pick the most probable word sequence. And if I choose A over here, right? And then if I choose apple out here, that doesn't make sense. In general, whether I'm going to, whether I choose A here really, really in principle depends on whether I I'm going to be choosing Apple out in the future. Now, uh, so from a, from a linguistic perspective, once you have these probabilities, what you choose in the future really must influence what you choose out here. Must it not? Yes. Right. So from a purely abstract point of view, this guy has computed this probability table and then you're deciding what was spoken based on some analysis of this probability table that's where we are and your decision is basically going to be deciding where the symbols must be output are you comfortable with that Yes, no, raise your hands. I, I'm comfortable with it, um, but I think what the confusion was was that the interdependence of the outputs um, comes at the stage in which you, you create the most probable sequence and for a, a um, and not all, because um, you're trying to, okay, in a, in a single directional recurrent neural network, the, the, la the later output does not necessarily depend on a later, or sorry, an output does not necessarily depend on the later input, but the interdependence comes in when you do a search and try to find the most probable sequence. That is correct. Yeah, and so I think people were getting confused when you had said that the output depends on it, but it's because you meant the so, final but, 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 but here's the point. So, so, so my point is that at the most abstract level, 
I'm not specifying whether this is unidirectional or bidirectional at this point, right? This entire sequence depends on the entire input sequence. That you agree? Oh, I, I totally agree. I think the confusion came from uh, came from people not understanding the, the, the total output versus the intermediate outputs as probability distributions. Right, okay. Yeah, so I think, a sorry, the problem is like, I think students don't understand the probable of like Y, zero, G, or like whatever words we have on this slide. Like they, these are like outputs at every stand step, which is like a probability. So I think like they're confused with that. Okay, so, uh, yeah. so you're absolutely right. Assume for now that this is unidirectional. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter for the purpose of this lecture, okay? So, the point is that this network is outputting a U probability distribution over the entire symbol sequence, or entire vocabulary of symbols at each time, right? And so what we've got here is that at each time, T equals one, two, three, four, five, we are getting a entire probability distribution over the entire vocabulary. And this probability distribution, this is a recurrent network. So if it were a unidirectional network, this probability distribution is only going to depend on the past. If this was a bidirectional network, it's going to depend on both the past and the future. But at the end of it all, at each time, you have a probability distribution over the entire vocabulary of symbols. And our job now is to say that this portion of the input was the word I, this portion of the input right here, because this is where the input ends, right? Is where I want to have, have, etc. Okay, so if it makes, if you're more comfortable with having the lower portion be unidirectional, let it be so, because it doesn't really affect the bigger picture. You have to, this bit has to be clear that there is a probability distribution being output at each time, because every column is identical to every other column. So is that come clear to you people? Raise your hands if it is. So if there are fewer than you know, 70 hands raised, I'm going to ask you why that is not clear and what is unclear. Everything builds off of this. I can spend an hour on this. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so personally, what I'm not understanding is, so for each time step, for instance, we have X. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. So for, for so you see on, on X zero, we have a couple of symbols, let's say five. But then again, uh, what I'm not understanding is, let's say we have our whole data and it has a vocabulary of, let's say, 10,000 symbols. Are we getting... Okay. And, and we're only encountering, so for instance, at X0, we're encountering, let's say, 10 symbols. On, How do you know that you've on, encountered 10 symbols? There is no way in hell that we could literally, we could have, um, right. so for instance, so, I went so, to the market. That's the first input. So you have so no way of no knowing, way. So, remember, so, so you have an entire speed signal going in, let's say. You have no way of knowing based only on the input exactly what was spoken without actually deciphering it yourself, correct? So which means okay. that, that means at each time, so if I say you, you, you told me I went to the market, okay? Yeah. But I went to the market is going to give me, I went to the market is say two seconds, three seconds. And if I have uh -huh. three, uh, three uh, uh, hundred uh, vectors per second, you're giving me 300 input vectors, right? So, okay. This is going to, your recurrent network is going to, let's assume it's unidirectional because the bidirectionality seems to be confusing folks, okay? So your recurrent network is going to be analyzing this and then what is the output going to be? The output is a softmax at each time, correct? Okay, yeah. And this is going to give you a, an output over all 10,000 of your symbols at each time. Okay. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, so, so, so basically, before we get 
to at least processing the data, we'll have to like create like a vocabulary of all the unique tokens of the entire data set before starting the process. Because this is, is a classification right? problem, correct? In a classification okay. problem, you always have classes. Here your classes are the symbols. Uh, okay, I get it now, I get it now. Okay, any other questions? There were some more hands raised. Um, I'm sorry, at X1, would you receive as input, say it's like unidirection, directional, and it's like this uh, graph that mm -hmm. um, here just raised. What is the input for X1? I'm a bit confused about whether it's like okay. its own sequence or like the whole sequence. So your input, so remember we are speaking of recurrent networks, correct? Yes. So, so when you have a recurrent network, so you're working on, this is a sequence to sequence model, time series models. That's what we've been talking about for three lectures, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. so if I have a speed signal, your speed signal is parameterized as a sequence of vectors. Yes. Okay, each of these is really a vector. So when you analyze your input, here's what you will do. Uh, assume this is unidirectional. You're going to sure. first pass in X1. And then your softmax is going to produce an output. This is a probability distribution, right? Yep, yep. And then your X2 goes in like so. And then you get your softmax. And then you produce a probability distribution. And then your X3 goes in. You yep. get a, so did this answer your question at all? Um, I get the part about the output. I was just a little bit confused about like at X1. So it's just like. At X1, so it's just going to be this one guy. At oh, X2, just. Okay. X2, okay. It's, it's, each of these is just that one input, right? And this. Oh, entire, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Cool. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the entire collection is going to be this entire sequence. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, Thank you. Uh, so these are the individual instance in the time series. Any more questions? Yeah, there was one about, um, can we see the probability distribution at any point uh, of the hidden state? There's no hidden state. The probability distribution is the output, right? So what we are doing, remember, remember what we did, this is a, this is a recurrent network. So your input goes in, it goes in through your hidden state, it goes in through your softmax, it produces an output. So this is, a, this, is a, this is available to you. Everything that's in red is available to you. Then your next input goes in, you have the recurrent computation of the hidden states. And then the hidden state of the next time goes into your softmax. And then this entire probability distribution is available to you. And then your next input goes in, you have the recurrent network, you know, computation of the hidden state, and then you have the next softmax, and then the next probability distribution comes out. So all of these are visible to you because these are outputs. These are the outputs from the output layer. Did that answer the question? Hi, prof Professor. So uh, we are calculating the probability distribution of a position. We can see the hidden states uh, of the subsequent uh, subsequent point uh, position, uh, like by using a bidirectional. Uh, Certainly. Uh, uh, but we cannot see the probability uh, distributions of the subsequent uh, positions. Is that correct? You can see it. The point is, this is your output. These are your outputs. You have achieved all of these. The speak of seeing versus computation is a different thing, right? You are, your network, you have some function f, okay? This is your network. The network has taken inputs x1 through xn, which is the entire sequence of inputs, okay? And that is going to produce y1 through yn. That's the, that's the standard, that's, that, that says the recurrent formalism, right? Yeah. So meaning you've seen every one of these guys. You actually have these available to you. Now, the question I think you're really asking is this, am I doing X1 through Xn and Y1 through Yn? Meaning to compute the output at each time, am I using the outputs at the previous time? Was that your question? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so 
in the structure that we are looking at, we are not going to look at, at that for the next couple of classes and probably you know, this is going to slide a bit because we are slow. But in the standard recurrent formalism that we looked at, we are only looking at the output is not feeding back into the network, right? Yeah. So this is just the hidden states. So this. So that that uh, that uh, they are outside of the computational graph, right? Right. These things are outside the computational graph at this point. At yeah. this point, because we will be doing more things with these. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Any more questions? I had one more question. Yeah. Um, since we're only looking at the input at each time point and the hidden state, but mm -hmm. yeah, we you said uh, we do not receive the output directly, but the hidden states give the outputs and we're we're gonna later optimize them to give the correct outputs, right? So that's why they kind of represent like the output, right? By just receiving the hidden state. You're sort of you're sort of jumping forward at least one three lectures or two lectures, right? You're absolutely right in that the hidden states carry information about what's happening in the future, but not entirely. And uh, we will see why, right? So uh, what is happening out here? Let me, you know, pre you presage the statement. What's happening out here? What am I really trying to do? I'm seeing this input sequence. I'm trying to decide what was spoken. And so to decide what was spoken, the simple thing for me to do would be to just say, pick up the most likely symbol at each time, right? So here it's G for the first two, F for the next four, E for the next two. But does this mean that somebody said G -g -e, 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 e? No, they didn't, right? This is just the sound G. This is just the sound E, or F in this case. This is just the sound E because you didn't produce 100 sounds per second. This is just one instance of the sound G. And so your best guess is going to be to merge all of these and say this was an instance of G, this was an instance of F, this was an instance of E, and this was an instance of D. So you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Yes. What you are really asking me is that if I had, instead of choosing full out here, if I had, although F is the most probable symbol in all of these, if I had chosen D, I would have chosen something else out here. That is your answer. That is your question, is it not? In the sense that what you choose out here influences what happens in the future. And uh, so if that if you wanted to influence what happens in the future, that must go back into the network. But we're not doing that. Or maybe I lost your question. What was the question again? Can you restate the question? All right. Okay, so did this make sense to you guys, what I'm doing here? Raise your hands if it did. Oh, also, we have a follow-up question. So mm -hmm. essentially, do you mean that we are doing the most probable path uh, search under the joint distributions rather than knife greedy search? So what do you mean by the joint distribution over here? So, okay, just bear with me, all right? So maybe these questions will be answered in some time uh, because at this point I am like 15 slides into 100. So uh, what is the problem with doing something of this kind? Just picking the most likely symbol at each time and merging them to decide what the order synchronous output must be. What if you have two characters that are the same right next to each other? You have no way of deciding whether this is, you know, two Fs, or 1F, right? You really don't have any way of deciding which one is the correct one, just by merging things. So you have a problem. This is not going to be, this is not going to solve it. Also, the resulting sequence may be completely meaningless. So, I mean, I can understand feed, but what is a good feed? I have no idea, right? So how could you fix this? Add blank symbols. You're adding blank symbols now, but we're not even getting to blanks for a while yet. When it, when it changes from one symbol to another? What you need is external constraints, right? You can say, I'm only going to accept symbol sequences, merges and symbol sequences that represent valid words in my dictionary. So you could have external constraints, right? 
So, uh, uh, or you can have like only allow sequences that correspond to uh, to dictionary words. So, so I won't look at all possible symbol sequences. I'll only look for symbol sequences corresponding to say things like bead. And amongst those guys, I will choose the one that is most likely. So for example, I'm not gonna look at, you know, this, this completely absurd output, but I may look for, I have all of these probability distributions. So I'm going to look for, you know, is the whole thing just A or, you know, is this A cat, right? I can search, to, or forget about the uh, sentences A and so is this A and then mm, right? So I can look through just the uh, symbol sequences that uh, are represent valid words in my dictionary. And this is an external constraint, or we can use this blank, but we'll get to the blank later. The point here is that, uh, if I do something greedy, which is to just select every, the most likely symbol at each time and begin merging things, what comes out can be meaningless. But this is a possibility that I can just like run the recurrent network through the input. I get a probability table at each time. I pick the most likely symbol. I merge these sequences. I get an output, which is autosynchronous. And that is an output. It may be wrong, but that's an output. Right, and so this process of obtaining the output from the network is what I'm going to call decoding. So, uh, and this is a suboptimal decode. Okay, what do I mean by a suboptimal decode? And again, this is something that we're going to get back to. But let's say I have x1 through xn, right? So I chose, for example, uh, let's say I'm comparing the words feed versus bead, okay? I have only two, I'm only, I'm, I'm only considering these two sequences. So when I pick the most likely symbol at each time and, and, and uh, compare them, so I could have F over here, E over here, and D over here, right? That's one way of come. So wh what I mean by doing this is, uh, uh, wait, let me draw this more clean. So I have my probability distributions at each time. And so I could be picking up, this is F, this is E, let's say, and this is D, let's say, right? So the e f. So if I, I if I were just picking up the feed, then if I were picking the most likely symbol sequence, symbol at each time and merging them, is this really the probability of getting feed given the input? If I just is this is this the only way of generating feed given the input? Have I lost you completely? Raise my hand, raise your hand if I've lost you completely. All right, so great. Don't even worry about it because we're gonna get back to this, okay? So here is the point. Our, 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 entire, our entire problem here is, there's a lot more to it. Our problem was this, we are given a collect sequence of inputs, X1 through Xn. I want to find the symbol sequence S1, S2 through Sk, given X1 through Xn. And we want to find the symbol sequence that was most likely given this input. And we found one solution for doing this, which was that uh, I had X1 through Xn at each time. I got a probability distribution, right? And then I just pick the most likely symbol at each time. And then I merge these things. Now, is this really guaranteed to be the most likely symbol sequence? Not necessarily. And we'll see why. Okay.
this is a greedy algorithm. I'm just picking the most likely one at each time and I'm merging them. And I'm saying this greedy solution is the more, you know, is my best guess for the most likely uh, symbol sequence given the input, okay? Hang on to that thought. We, I should have ideally answered that question already, but because uh, uh, we've been a bit slow, we'll get to that later, okay? The bigger issue is this, that of training. So what we've seen so far, we, the problem was we do not know when to output symbols because the network produces outputs at every time. We don't know which of these are the real outputs. And so one greedy solution was to simply pick the most, like, most likely symbol at each time and pick the last in the sequence as saying this is the real output. At least at that level, I assume that that made sense. Did that make sense? So this is the key piece, right? That we want to, we had some inputs and we know that you need some outputs at, you need to read, generate a sequence of outputs, but you don't know what times these outputs must be generated. So what we did was to pick the most likely symbol at each time. And then whenever we got a continuous sequence, we just picked the last one and said, this guy is it. Then, we had a continuous sequence, we pick the last one and say, this guy is it. We got another continuous sequence, we pick the last one and said, this guy is it. And that was our, that was a pretty good guess. And so that was one way of deciding when to actually output symbols. So we've sort of seen one very hacky algorithm and that I probably confused you about why this is not a great algorithm, but we have one, seen one way of doing this. Let's hang on to that thought, okay? Uh, now, the real issue here, is how do you train these models? Let's not even worry about the inference portion for now, right? I'm going to give you some data and I've given you an input sequence and then I've given you an output sequence. The input sequence is a sequence of vectors. The output is a sequence of symbols, but the target output is a sequence of symbols, which is, which is of a smaller length than the input sequence itself, okay? And using this, you must train the model. Now, ideally, if you got proper training data, the information that you would be given is that here is the input sequence, here is the sequence of symbols that I want output, but you would also be told that this symbol B must occur at time two, this symbol R must occur at time six, this symbol T must occur at time nine. So this is the ideal uh, kind of training data that you would be given. So this one here is what I will call an alignment of these output symbols to the input. Again, are you, com are you comfortable with the distinction between uh, the time synchronous and the order synchronous outputs. Yes, no. Yes. Okay. So this is an order synchronous output, but each symbol occurs at a specific time. Okay. And so in your ideal world, this is the training information that you're given. So what are we really given over here? We are given the inputs, if I give you the specific information, I'm given, you know, X2, I'm given the, the inputs, then I'm given the information about where the symbols must be output. So in other words, I have been given the alignment of the output sequence to the input sequence. This is the alignment. Did that make sense? When I tell you exactly where, at which time each symbol must be output. So this is like saying, here is the speech. The word spoken was bead. So I have told you how the phonemes align with the input. 
So I've given you this alignment. Did the notion of an alignment make sense to you? So if I have this align, actually I have the label for each position, right? Effectively you're saying that you, you, this is an order synchronous input, right? Uh, label. So you're telling me where the symbol B must be, must be output, where the symbol E must be output, where the symbol D must be output. Okay. Right? Is this the only way of aligning the sequence to the input? Consider this, right? Or in this case, I've used the word but. If I've got, say, 10 vectors coming in, there are different ways in which the, a person could have said the word but. They could have dragged the bur out, they could have dragged the out, they could have had a, had a really short term. They could have had a short bur, a longer, and a small, a longer T. So there are many different ways in which the same word could have been spoken and produced an input of the same length. So is this making sense? Yes. Okay. So when I tell you exactly where each symbol, what has happened to me? Okay. When I, when I tell you exactly where each symbol must be output, I'm giving you the alignment of the symbol sequence to the input. Right? If I simply tell you that the word spoken was but, you do not have this alignment. Because you know that ber, er, and ter were produced, but you have no idea of whether the person spoke like this, or whether the person spoke like this, or whether the person spoke like this. Does that make sense? Raise your hands, guys. So the notion of an alignment has to be clear. And the fact that when I give you the order synchronous symbol sequence, you're still missing the information about the alignment must also be clear. Okay. And now, so suppose I give you the alignment, then I'm telling you specifically that the symbol ber occurred at time two, er occurred at six, ter occurred at time nine. So I've given you this alignment along with the input. And when I give you this kind of alignment, then it's very easy, right? For you to train a model. Uh, what you can do is say, okay, at time two, you can read the output of the network. And that's going to give you a probability distribution of our symbols. You know that the target symbol is ber. You can compute, compute the callback level divergence. At time six, you read the output of the network. You know that it must output R. You compute the KL divergence. At time nine, you do the same thing. You sum these divergences. That's going to be the total divergence between the target output and the output of the network. You can compute the derivatives and learn all the parameters of the network. Right? Yes, no. Raise your hands. Yes. Okay. So I'm assuming you got it. Or when I just do this, I'm actually ignoring all of these other outputs which really do carry information. So what I can do is to pretend that all of these guys also are the same as this symbol that these three guys are the same as this symbol, that these two guys are the same as this symbol. In which case what I've done is to replicate the B out here, replicate the R at these points and replicate the T at these points. And now I've sort of expanded my order synchronous sequence to this full length. And I'm com I can compute the divergence between this expanded sequence obtained by replicating my symbols to fill up these holes. And that could be the divergence I compute between my target output and the actual output. Are you comfortable with that too? Yes, no? Yes. Right? Very straightforward, nothing fancy. And what is the divergence going to be now? I'm going to be summing over all time. But at each time I have now an associated symbol and you know the callback liable divergence, the cross entropy divergence is simply the 
first negative of the summation over all time of the log of the probability assigned to the target symbol at each time. Straightforward. And that you can divert, and that you can uh, differentiate and, and train your network. But now here's the problem. Suppose during train, when I give you the training data, I don't actually give you where each symbol occurred. This is the most realistic situation, right? I give you some speech and say, this was the word, but. I'm not gonna say the phoneme b ended here, the phoneme a ended here, the phoneme t ended here. So in this case, how would you train the network? Does anybody wanna take a guess? Anyone? Yes, um, maybe look at the adjacent outputs. We don't know. Okay, look at the adjacent outputs, explain. Um, like if you see a bar in this time step and you see a, a bar before. But you don't know that you've seen a bar. What is the network actually outputting? Uh, probabilities. Exactly. So you don't know that you've seen a bar. Or the same probability, the max from before is the same as the current one. Then again, so again you're, in, assume you're, you're initializing the network. The probabilities are going to be random, right? Mm. Right. So how would you do it? Sorry, we have like options on the chat where students are saying maybe train the model on all possible alignments. Aha, uh -huh. okay, you're getting there, right? But here's a simpler thing, right? Two solutions, I can guess the alignment or I can consider all possible alignments, right? So guessing the alignment, I start off with some initial alignment. I'm just gonna randomly guess, this is how it is. You know the order. I come up with some initial align, initial guess. And then I can train the network using this initial guess for the alignment. Then I can use the learned model to re-estimate the alignment for each training instance. And then estimate the, uh, and then use the re-estimated training alignment, which is hopefully going to be better than your random initial alignment, and go back and re-estimate your models. When you get an updated model, then I can go back and re-estimate the alignment yet again, and then go back and repeat the process. So is that making sense to everyone? That's a, that's a cheap, simple yes. thing. Yeah, okay. The question is, yeah, there are two hands raised. Questions, anyone? No, okay. Yeah, um, Professor Picture, I have a question. Yeah. So um, I, I'm a little confused about the, uh, the alignments because so if it was if this was say a speech recognition um, task, um, if an, an, an utterance can have variable length, and uh, in in that sense, wouldn't wouldn't that make all possible alignments uh, infinite? No, is it? I'm giving you the word sequence, right? I'm giving you the phonemes. I'm telling you this is the word. This is the phoneme. This was the word, but. Okay. Oh, okay, and, okay. So within right, the context, so, so, okay. And, and the input is 100 frames long. You're going to have, and it's constrained. You're going to have, it's going to be very large, but you're picking one of those, right? And the question really is, how are you going to pick one? Because you have all of these alignments. So how do I define an alignment? An alignment, right. we've already defined an alignment, but the way I'm going to define the alignment is in this manner. I'm going to replicate the symbol. Remember, we are, we are replicating the symbols in order to compute the divergence, right? So to characterize an alignment, I'm going to say that I'm going to, so these were all alignments, except the way I will, I will think about it. I'm going to ex rep replicate the symbols to fill up the holes. And so these are three different alignments of the word, but to an input of length 10. And now given a model, I have to pick one of these three. In fact, there are going to be many, many more, right? How would you decide which one to pick? Anyone? What is the criterion? Uh, the least divergence. The least divergence, again, how I, did. actually, it's a good answer. That's a very good answer, right? Or the most probable. Because remember, the least divergence is basically the most probable, right? Mm -hmm. So, you want to pick the most probable sequence alignment. So uh, here is some terminology. 
if I've got, uh, I have an inputs, uh, say X1 through X100, right? So, and I know that the word was, what is the word I have? But, then, but is order synchronous, but not time synchronous, right? So one way for me to define the alignment is to say, I'm going to replicate all of my symbols so that I have one symbol at each time. That's going to give me my alignment, right? But in the process of replicating it, this is giving me a time synchronous. expansion of my order synchronous sequence. So do you see what happened between here and here? Is this clear to guys? Yes. Okay. So the problem of defining, estimating the alignment can now be stated as saying, find me the time synchronous variant of this order synchronous sequence that is most probable, right? Basically, find me this one, which is most probable. Now, there's the reverse of it as well. Suppose I give you a time synchronous sequence. Oh gosh, this is my whiteboard design finished. And of course, I'm running over time, very slow. So, suppose I'm given a time synchronous sequence. So, was there was there a question? So, okay. Suppose I'm given a time synchronous variant of the sequence. What is the actual order synchronous sequence here? Anyone? So when, I'm you giving, tell, when you not be able to tell because there could be like repeated Bs or Ts? Uh, your your uh, sound is kind of muffled. I can't hear you properly. Oh, sorry. Um, wouldn't you not be able to tell because there might be repeated Bs in a row? So the point is, this is my time synchronous sequence, right? Remember, for example, when I had X1 through Xn and I picked the most likely symbol at each time, I got one symbol at each time, right? So this is going to be my time synchronous sequence. I can, so the reduced version of it that we chose was a but, right? Now, this is not unique as you point out, you're correct. But let's, let's not worry about the non-uniqueness of it for now. Assume that this, is, that this is unique. We will deal with the non-uniqueness of it later, okay? So this is a compression. of this guy, correct? This is one compression of the longer one. Because I just eliminated the duplicates. So yeah, this, but, yeah. but do we need position for the compression version? No, we don't. Once I compress it, right? I've just got the order synchronous symbol, symbol sequence. So. Okay. Uh, whether you keep it or not is not the question. The point is this. I can go from a time synchronous to an order synchronous output by compressing. And when I do this, I, I technically lose the timing information. I can go from the order synchronous to the time synchronous by expansion but for this, I will need the timing information. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay. So these are the two things that we're going to be looking at. We like working with time synchronous sequences because now there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input and the output. Our real problem is that when you're training, you get order synchronous uh, uh, labels. And so you have no way of knowing how to expand it because the timing information is missing. So 
here is what we want to do. You have the unaligned or the uh, order synchronous, I'm calling with compressed or unaligned uh, symbol sequence is S O S zero to S K minus one. Like you know, I'm using my examples keep changing here. It's B F. I have an, some some input of some length n, and I want to find an n length expansion of this guy, basically by repeating these symbols, such that what comes out is now time synchronous. So the problem of estimating an alignment is to find out how to repeat the symbol so that this order synchronous sequence now becomes time synchronous. That's the problem of estimating the alignment. So the problem of estimating the alignment is you're just given but, and it's the problem of expanding the but out into a form of this kind mm -hmm. so that it went from being order synchronous to time synchronous, okay? And so that's really what we want to do. We want to, the way we will do it, we will find the expansion, the alignment, that is most likely given the compressed sequence and the input. This is the alignment problem. Is this making sense to you guys? Yes. Okay. And so there's supposed to be a poll here, but I'll skip the poll. So Rashmi, let's skip the poll, right? So again, recall, this is the actual output of the network. You're gonna have a probability distribution at each time, right? Now, suppose I was told that this input is actually for the word, say, beefy, right? It has four symbols. Now, how can I use this particular table to find the alignment? Now, the cheap greedy thing is I can just pick the most likely symbol at each time. But if I pick the most likely symbol at each time, will I necessarily get an alignment for beefy? For my target sequence, will I? Not necessary. No. Not necessary because the most likely symbol can be anything, right? And so, in fact, although my target sequence only has bur, e, and fur, I can get any odd symbol over here. So, what would be a simple way of ensuring that I only get these symbols? The trivial thing I can do is to say I'm going to block out all the rows of this probability table that are not my target symbols, right? And now I can pick the most likely symbol from the remaining rows. So is this making sense to you guys? Uh, professor, uh, in this case, wouldn't you be also, wouldn't you also be likely to pick symbols out of order like E? Thank you, right? E, uh, if... Okay, you're absolutely right. But you understand what I'm doing here. I'm putting a restriction over here. And putting a restriction is the same as saying that I have this probability table, I'm just copying bur, e, and fur over. This is the rows for those three guys over. And then I'm going to work only of these reduced grid because that way you've sort of blocked everything else out, okay? This way you're assured that only the appropriate symbols will be hypothesized, but the problem is there's no guarantee that you're going to get things in the right order, right? So how can I improve on this? Anyone? Fix the first and last one. Pardon me? Fix the first and last one. Yeah, last I can fix one. the first and last one, but, I, but I'm still going to get any arbitrary order of things, right? Uh, we could fix the transitions. So like we could make the transitions happen only the way we want them to. So that's right. Here's what you really want to do, okay. So this one doesn't still, it, it still doesn't uh, ensure that the output is a valid alignment, right? So here, this is rubbish. So I'm going to try something different. I'm going to copy the rows from the output table, output probability table of the network and arrange them top to bottom in the same order as the symbol sequence I'm trying to align. So here, for example, if I'm trying to align B feed to the input, I'll just take the row for burr from here and make this my first row here. Then I'm going to take E and make this my second row. I can take the row for fur, make this my third row, and then the fourth one is E. So I'll copy E over again. So 
observe that when E occurred twice, I actually ended up copying it twice. Okay. And so this is, and now, uh, so here, for example, E occurs in both the second and the fourth position, right? This is the process of constructing this table, making sense to you guys? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. So here is a very simple pseudocode for it, right? I'm given the compressed symbol sequence as I'm creating my probability table, which is this little s. So I'm going through all of these symbols in this sequence and I'm pulling the corresponding row out of the probability table of the network and stacking them up. So this little pseudocode is basically just uh, composing this, this, this table, okay? And now I can explicitly uh, say that when I want to compose an alignment, I, uh, I will decode from this table. Remember the process of getting an output sequence from, an in, from, from the probability table is what we call decoding. I'm only going to decode from this table, but then I'm going to put this additional constraint that somebody mentioned which is that I want the first symbol to always be this top left guy. I want this last symbol to always be this bottom right guy. But then I can put an extra constraint that any path I take through this table must monotonically go from the top left to the bottom right. And I'm not allowed to skip rows. So when I do this, you're guaranteed that the sequence of symbols that you will get is going to be compressible to the sequence beefy. Does that make sense? Yes, no, raise your hands. I'll wait for you to, this is very easy, right? So how can I actually do this? Here's what I can do. I'm going to actually compose, con uh, modify this into a graph where I'm going to treat each cell of this, net, of this table as a node. And then from each cell, I'm going to have two outgoing edges, one into the same row and one going diagonally down to the next row at the next time. So there's the same row at this next time and the next row at the next time. And so uh, I have become, at, and this graph now has a uh, structure, uh, has, has a property. I'm going to assign a score of one edge score of one to every, every edge in this graph. And now if I take any path, valid path through this graph from the source to the sink, you're guaranteed that that valid path is going to be an actual alignment of beefy to the input. So this makes sense as you, right? And now I'm going to pick the most probable path through this graph. But to pick the most probable path, I need a need to way I need a way to define the score, or the probability of any path, and the probability of any path through this graph is simply going to be the product of the probabilities at the various nodes on the path. So, for example, the probability of this partial path is going to be the probability of b at time zero times the probability of b at time one times y e2 times y e3 times y f4. So y e3 is the probability assigned to the symbol 3 e at time 3 by the network. So is this making sense to everyone? Raise your hands. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, so I see that we have two edges for each, each node how do we know like which edge it's supposed to take since you gave yet. them the same? So we don't yet, right? How many paths are there from, from the source node to the sink node on this graph? Uh, a couple. <laughs> a couple, there are an exponential <laughs> number, right? So yeah, here, for yeah, example, like, and, you know, if, so there are a lot, right? So, I mean, in the worst case, well, here it's constrained. You only have you only have two children, but it's still going to be quite a lot, okay? And we're going to have to pick the most probable, uh, a typical end-to-end -end path is going to be something of this kind. And in the worst case, they're gonna be an exponential number of such paths. 
and we want to find the path with the highest probability right and so, searching so by path do you mean like at some point we're assigning let's say probabilities to each edges and then we're going to take so all the edges have probability has... one all the nodes remember we just copied the nodes from the probability output table of the network yeah so we actually have these probabilities i have these values y written at each time right right okay and so we are trying to we're going to find the most probable path from the source to the sink and they can use this do this using any dynamic programming algorithm okay i get it now i get it now right. yeah okay and so and that we can do using the viterbi algorithm how many of you are familiar with the viterbi algorithm raise your hands okay lower your hands how many of you are not familiar with viterbi because i'll spend 5 minutes on this raise your hands if you're not familiar with viterbi algorithm okay fine that's quite a number okay so here's the problem we want to find the most likely path the most probable path from source to sink and guys i'm going to go 5 minutes over then i will stop but i have a great deal of this lecture left over because i only managed to get halfway through it i will finish it today after the break so uh anyway uh we want to find the most likely path from the source to the sink okay here's what we're going to do consider the most likely path from here to just this red node i'm looking for the most likely path path from one point to the other okay from this from the first node this y0b to the to the to the third node in the fourth column now this node has only two parents correct the way we drew the graph this node has only two parents so this means that the most probable path from here to here must be either an extension of the most probable path to this guy or an extension of the most probable path to this guy there are no other choices correct does that make sense yep raise your hands if it makes sense there were 30 of you who didn't understand which would be so i want to see all 100 hands raised this time raise your hands if this made sense i'll wait Seventy-three. So there are still a great many people who didn't get it. Any questions on chat? No, there aren't. So what happened to the rest of you? Raise your hands, guys. I'll wait. So I want to see a hundred hands raised. If, if this made sense, keep your hands raised. I'll tell you what. Oh, wait. Yeah. I have a question. So the best path, like down the tree, is the best path up the tree. Is that what this is kind of saying? I'm saying that the best path. the most probable path from here to here this has yeah. only two parents so it can the most probable path has to come either through this or this there's no other choice oh okay yeah correct yeah that's clear and so and because you're speaking of most probable why would you choose the second most probable path to this point you wouldn't right right so the most probable path has to be an extension of either the most probable path to this guy or the most probable path to this guy right hmm. Yeah. Which of which of those two would you choose? Uh whichever one's most probable. Whichever one has the most probable path locally at this point, right? Yeah. I'm ready. And so that's your algorithm right there, right? You're going to get a dynamically track this is your Viterbi algorithm. You're going to dynamically track the best path and the score to the best path from the source node to every node in the graph. And at each node, you're going to keep track of the best incoming parentage. and the score of the best path from the source to the node to this parentage and eventually compute the best path from source to sink this is basically what we're going to do okay so okay. here's here's what we're going to do uh first you construct this probability table right and so this notation r represents the row number okay here there are 1 2 3 4 0 1 2 3 those are my row numbers and so y t s r is the probability assigned to the symbol in the rth row 
at time t by the network. So here, for example, y t s two is y t s. If it's indexing zero, y t s one is always going to be the same as y t s three because the second and the fourth rows are identical, right? So uh, those are the just notation. And so here's what we'll do. Start at the first column. The most probable path to this guy is just one symbol long, right? So this one, this, 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 this top left, left node has no parent. And the score for the of the most for the probability of the most probable path to this point is simply the probability of the symbol out here itself. The probability of the most probable paths to these guys is all zero. They're all zero because no path is allowed to begin from these points, right? So this first column, we've already decided how this must be done. Is this clear to everyone? Raise your hands. The first column. Okay. So this is ignoring everything. So this is just looking at the first column and ignoring the future, okay? Now let me go one step forward. This node here has only one parent. So it's a special case. So its best parent is just this one. Fine. What is the probability of the most likely path to this guy from here to here? Anyone? What's it going to be? Is it 50%? 50%? No. It's going to be the probability of this node. One. No. So again, the probability of this path is the prob yb0 times yb1. Um, okay. But didn't we fix that to be? B. So I'm saying, so the edges have score one, but the nodes have probabilities we've got from the probability table, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So, and the probability of a path is the probability of the product of the probabilities of all the nodes in the path. Yes, yeah, that's So this right. is gonna be these two, right? What about this guy? What is its best parent? Here. Y zero. Because this guy has a score probability of zero, so this the best parent is this one. You're going to store that. And what is the probability of the best path to this guy? Y zero b. Y zero b times y zero. Y zero b times y one e, right? And yeah. these two guys, of course, because they only their parents all have uh, you know zero probability. They're going to have zero probability as well. Now, uh, so consider the next time instant. This one, if you look at any symbol over here, the first thing you will do is to decide which of its two. So at this point for each node, you're storing the best parent, you're storing the identity of the best parent and the probability of the best path into the node, okay? Now, when you come to any intermediate node over here, you would look at both of its parents or all of its parents, and there are more than two parents, but here there are only two, and ask which of the two parents has the higher score? So which of the two parents has the higher best path score? And there are two parents. It's the same, it is the uh, node in the same row at the previous time, which is this guy, or the node in the previous row at the previous time, which is this guy. You would compare the best path scores to the two, and you'd pick the one for which that score was highest. And you're going to say, my bet, the best path to this node comes through the better of these two guys. And you're going to store that as your back pointer. You're pointing back to that node from this, from this node. So uh, drawing the figure, I mean, if I were to be more explicit, I'm running a little over, but just so, so say uh, I have, some path coming to these two guys. So for this node, I'm going to say, ask, is the best path probability here higher or is the best path probability here higher? And if I find that this is higher, I'm going to store a back pointer to this one, like so. And then the best path probability here itself is going to be the best path probability to this node times the probability of this node. Very straightforward, okay? And so, uh, I can just go down this entire column and perform that little computation for 
each node, find the best parent, point to the best parent, and then the store the best path probability to the node as the probability of the best parent times the probability of the symbol itself. So I go down this column, and at, when I'm done with the column, for every node, I have the best parent and the best path probability to the node computed. Then go forward to the next column and repeat the computation. You know, pick the best parent and then uh, put a point, place a pointer to the best parent and then compute the best path probability to the node itself. Keep doing this all the way to the end, column by column, column by column, right? And so at each time, if I have n symbols, I'm going to perform n computations and I'm going to perform it for t columns. So the total number of computations is really finite. It's very, very manageable. And now, of course, I know that at the best final time, I must be in this node. This was how we had, uh, we had set up our problem, right? So I will start at this node at each in the process of going forward, I have actually managed to find out the best parent for each node. So I will start at this each node and I will track my best parents backward. I know what this one's best parent was. I know what this one's best parent was. If I track it backward, eventually I must get a path all the way to the source node. And so this path over here is now guaranteed to be the most likely path from source to sink. Because at each time, we already had the most probable path to the intermediate nodes. So when you get all the way to the end, you're gonna get the most probable path from source to sink. And so this is going to be your re-estimated alignment of the symbol sequence to the input. So I just have the, which will be a pseudocode over here. Uh, please go through the pseudocode because you're gonna, uh, we're going to sort of refer to it in the next lecture. But what will happen now is that once you do this, you have, you started with, you're given some model. Using that model, you can, you can run inference on the input and you're going to get some probability distribution, uh, output probability tables. Using those output probability tables, you can, you can construct this reduced probability table. You can run the Viterbi algorithm on it and it's going to give you an, a new alignment. Now we can use that new alignment as the updated alignment for the input of, of the symbol sequence to the input. And then you can use these new alignments to, uh, to train your models, to, to update your models. And uh, what is the divergence for this new alignment? Again, remember, the divergence for the new alignment is simply going to be the sum over all time of the negative of the log of the probability assigned to the symbols and the alignment by the model, right? This is just a straightforward uh, divergence. The derivative of the divergence, of course, is simply going to be the uh, you uh, the uh, at each time is simply going to be the derivative of this term. Uh, so at each time, there's only one target symbol, clearly. So it's going, you're going to have minus one over the probability assigned to that target symbol by the network and zero elsewhere. So this is just the derivative for the alignment, divergence of the alignment with respect to your input. Once you compute the derivatives, you can go back and train the models, right? So here is the overall process. You initialize some alignments, you train the models, you can uh, use the models to obtain new alignments. You can go back and retrain the models with the new alignments and iterate the process until the whole algorithm converges and the model converges, okay? So is this clear to everybody? I'll start. I apologize for going five minutes, you know, plenty over, but yes. Yeah, yes, I, I have another question. So I know you're, uh, running over with time. But uh, in the previous slides where you black out the uh, certain rows, um, you know, in the first column, that makes sense. We know like the first letter should be or first. So, okay, so, so, so the reason I blah, 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 blocked it out in the second row is that what you're going to find is that for the second column, the best parent has a probability of zero, regardless of which one you choose. Yeah, oh, that's, okay. That's about it, right? 
So black simply means that I've assigned those to zero. Okay. But yes, Shams, what was your question? Oh, I actually was raising hand to say, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, right, all right. And so yeah. another, another key piece that, is, that, that matters is, is everybody comfortable with this divergence formula? Anybody who didn't get it? I had a question. Yeah. So is the alignment, that's for, is that for the predictions or is that for like the actual ground truth? Uh, your voice was muffled. Can you come closer to the mic? Yeah, so for the alignment, is that for the prediction or is that for like the ground truth? So this is your ground truth. This is your training data, right? I see. And so this is during training. You're aligning the symbol sequence to the input. Okay. Right? So all that happened was uh, that the alignment gives you at each time, x1, x2, xn, it's going to give you a symbol, b, b, e, etc. right? And so your divergence, uh, and again, just to reiterate, your divergence is going to be minus summation over t log of y of the symbol that you've assigned to the time and that, that you've given to that time. And when you take the derivative, obviously this is the only symbol that figured over here. So the derivative is for, for this specific time, yt, the derivative of the divergence with respect to yt is going to be zero for everything except the one symbol that got aligned against it. And for that, it's going to be minus one over yBT, okay? So this was, uh, uh, this was the key piece. Anyway, this so far so good. So here's how the iterative algorithm would work. Uh, you'd initialize your models, then you'd, or, or, or you'd initialize alignments and train an initial model then determine alignments for every training instance, then train the model on the entire training set and iterate. The problem with this, and there are different ways of doing this. You can, you know, you can keep updating your model after each sequence or do this in batches or whatever. The problem is that this is heavily dependent on the initial alignment. And so prone to lower, low, poor local optima. And so in the next class, we will look at an alternate solution where we do not commit to any given alignment during a pass, but we actually consider all possible alignments. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording right here. I've gone way over.